Welcome to the North Group Podcast. At North Group, we are often invited into organizations to influence leadership and organizational behavior. It is absolutely fascinating work. I'm your host, Roger North, and we'd like to invite you into that conversation. I've been in business uh, quite a long while, John, and I don't know how well my memory serves me on this, but it has to be many, many years, perhaps decades, where I've heard the phrase, the idiom, what gets measured gets done. And I think you and I both believe there's a lot of truth to that. Absolutely. But there's layers underneath that. So let's start with the truth of this idiom. In our podcast lately, we've been deconstructing, I guess you would say, uh, some popular idioms that, that get said in life and more specifically in business. And we hear, well, you and I have been hearing what gets measured gets done for mm -hmm. as long as I can remember. Is there truth to it? Sure, absolutely. I think there is truth to it. I think it's Andy Stanley who has said, uh, direction, not intention, determines destination. And what I think about what, measure, what, what gets measured gets done, I'm not so sure that works with all of the New Year's resolutions <laughs> that we're going to measure our weight, we're going to measure mm -hmm. this, we're going to measure our time. These are all good intentions, but when you get down to, in business in particular, what you're measuring gets done is very true. But I think the corollary question to that is, are we sure we're measuring the right things? That's, pro that's probably the most important piece of our conversation here today, mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Yes. And I was also thinking as we were preparing for this conversation, how, I, don't, I guess I don't really want to start with the negative, but I'll start here anyway how human behavior can get skewed by the belief that what gets measured gets done and measurements that do not lead us to the most important outcomes, Yes, which probably yeah. leads us to the challenge of quantitative and qualitative. Because mm -hmm. it's really setting up quantitative measurements is, I'm not sure I want to say easy, but easier mm -hmm. than setting up qualitative measurements, mm -hmm. which some may even regard as an oxymoron. What are your thoughts on, and we want to put this in an organizational context, what are your thoughts about how you would effectively, as a, as a, as a leader of clarity, balance out qualitative measurements with quantitative measurements? So at some level, Roger, I wonder if it's a forest for the trees style of conversation. So we hone in on what we want to measure, but do we ask ourselves why we are measuring it? And then why does it matter? And then a third why is what is our why? Hmm. As That's a lot of whys, John. So it's three whys. It's three whys that kind of line up that way. But at some point, I think we have to come back to that. David Brooks had a great op-ed in the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago, and it was around the timing of the explosion of data science. Okay. And data science has an awful lot of measures. So one of his tenets in this, uh, this op-ed was how the additional information creates really in, in many ways a lot of noise and the signal to noise ratio actually expands. So the more information we get, the more uh, confusing it can get to draw out of that the information that actually matters? Correct. That kind of idea? Absolutely. And with a preponderance of information, we could begin to see threads in that information that actually take us off of the core reason we were measuring it in the first place. Really good. I'm following you. Okay. So, for instance, when it gets to this qualitative, quantitative piece... Um, the, the example was used, we can track all kinds of data about our interactions with our work teams and our workflow. And we, we know that 76% of the time this is happening and our completion rates at 34%. And we have all of these interactions, but what it can't tell us is why the close friend that we have, that we only see twice a year at most, we are closer with and engaging in conversation than the folks that we see 76% of the time. Hmm. So what does it really 
measure or, or do we give it context around what those measurements mm -hmm. are? Mm -hmm. So we're measuring performance, we're measuring effectiveness. Right now we're measuring in this environment, uh, retention, labor mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. What's a connected relationship look like? Mm -hmm. A lot of conversations are going on around that right now. Mm -hmm. We can measure interactions, but we can't necessarily measure the quality, the quality of, the of those interactions. So let, let's pull back a second. I, I liked when you talked about context there, and that probably goes back to David Brooks's observation is, isn't it a, organizationally speaking now, isn't it a leadership responsibility to continue to call people back to context? Absolutely. And context uh, in an organization, I think we would say, and, and many of the uh, popular writers now would say, that the why that sets the context is what we really need to understand. Yes. So this, this WHY question is extraordinarily important. It's proliferating among people in our business and our clients, which I think is a wonderful uh, proliferation. Mm -hmm. And so it goes to purpose. So how mm -hmm. do we relate uh, context to purpose? And then how do we contextualize our measurements, some of which necessarily would be quantitative, but perhaps the most important of which would be qualitative? Yes. I would I I think there is a recognition which way the needle tilts. Okay. So if you're going to use a particular measure within your organization, understand what it's telling you. It's giving you a quantitative bent. Okay. In that analysis. You need to come back at some point and say, okay, so what is, what what is the influence on the qualitative aspect mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. it? And and I agree, that is the leader's responsibility to make sure that that question gets asked because otherwise I believe what happens in the measures is that they can become subtly transactional. Yes. Okay. And when something moves to transactional, you, in, in many ways, you're moving away from qualitative. It is a measure of something that's been experienced. It doesn't necessarily create the experience. I'm thinking of something. It just came into my mind. You see if this is helpful. I'm thinking of something where we really seem to be experiencing that tension. And that is in a visit to our primary care doctor's office. Yes. So if I would go back, pick a number. Well, certainly if I would go back to my childhood, mm -hmm. our family doctor grew up with my dad on the same street and was our next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. And it was common for him to bring his literal black doctor's bag over to our house and attend to my strep throat as I laid on my family's living room mm -hmm. sofa. I don't think the amount of time that it was going to take him to get his black bag, come to our house, spend time with me, spend time with my folks, ever entered his mind. I'm not saying that the way things are, are, are being done now uh, in that business, the business of, of medicine is not necessary because I don't know enough about it. Mm -hmm. But a visit to the doctor's office now seems to be largely driven by the number of minutes that that doctor is allowed by whatever system he or she is working for to spend with John Zeswitz. And then that almost has to affect the qualitative outcome, doesn't it? I would say that's a great example. Uh, you and I have both... Uh had friends who have gone through a variety of circumstances in their lives. For sure. And I can think of a couple who have interacted with what would be considered the highest quality of health care available in this country. And it never ceases to amaze me that there's a, com there, there's a common thread with the quality of the care, the quality of the interaction in those environments. Where a phone call is placed, I'm sorry, the doctor isn't available right now. Can I have your contact information? Mm -hmm. And the surgeon calls the patient back. Mm. Now, if we're looking purely on a transactional scale, we're looking at what we're paying per hour for that individual. And is that phone call the best use of their time? Well, if that's the measure, that's the answer. 
But if the measure is patient care and quality of care and quality of interactions, which at some level you would have to be able to posture that the measures, of the, the measures that come out of those institutions outperform, that's why they have the reputations that they do, mm -hmm. what is it about the nature of the quality of the interaction that occurs? I'm reminded of a conversation that I had a few years ago uh, with one of two neurologists in the country of Kenya. Okay. And in, in Kenya, there is a proliferation of uh, hydrocephalism. And in Kenya, so it's a swelling of the, it's a swelling of the head. It, 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 it complicates a lot of functions. In Kenya, they developed a very different way that they were going to approach this to the point where the United States was sending medical teams to Kenya to learn how to do this. They had a couple of observations. He had a couple of observations. He said, in Kenya, we don't worry about sterile. We worry about clean. Hmm. In Kenya, if we perform a medical procedure on a child, we allow the mother to sleep in the bed with the child wow. during their recovery. Mm -hmm. And we have found that the child's recovery expedites. Wow. Now, if transactionally we are looking at speed and investment cost, that is one set of measures, but it isn't necessarily the, the story. Yeah, or the whole story. The whole story. And of course, our purpose today is not to criticize the, I just, the healthcare industry. I, I just can't imagine how Incredibly complicated we, we are in the best healthcare system in the world. There are pieces of it we wish would operate differently, but I can't imagine how mm -hmm. challenging that equation is over against cost and all the other factors. So let's switch it more to a, maybe a common business organization sure. where you and I would both know of businesses whose primary measurement, what gets measured gets done, mm -hmm. is something that has to do with money. Yes. And we would all have heard the phrase, you know, no margin, no mission, or, or, or however we would characterize that. And there's absolute truth to that. We must pay attention to that number. Mm -hmm. I think that the ease of applying qualitative measurements, and you referred to data science earlier, the proliferation of measurements, quantitative measurements that are available, may be doing us a disservice at a certain level over against the difficulty of applying the very best qualitative measurements. Absolutely. And I think that would be a piece of what David Brooks proffered years ago, is that the proliferation of those measures can obscure our values. Yeah, yeah. But how our are we going to measure values, John? I, I, there's got to be some folks listening to us here today are saying, hey, I'm tracking with you, John. Yep. Um, I like what you're saying, but... Man, that's hard. I just hate having that conversation with, 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 with my employee about uh, transparency, for instance. Maybe transparency is, a, is an organizational core value for that organization. Mm -hmm. And there's just that employee where there, there's, there's, there's something that's blocking a real conversation every time I have it with that person. And yet our core value is transparency. We believe it leads to other better outcomes in many iterations of our business. How do we have a conversation with a person about something so difficult as that? So Roger, I think one of the things that I, I, I love that is core here at North Group for us is that we, you know, through the, through the idea of sustained relationship, mm -hmm. right? We're developing leaders in their organizations to their highest potential. You use two words as the entree into that, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It is. I agree. It's time consuming. You cannot have the conversation once and know that it's going to have occurred. It is an investment of time mm -hmm. over time that begins to move that layer by layer. Now, transactionally, if we measure it, we can get to our yes and no really quickly. Well, this person's lining up. Yep. They scored this on the performance evaluation. Yep. They're obviously not getting there. Now I've got a, 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 a computed way to make my decision. Mm -hmm. It's hard to consistently have conversations and actively listen and to recognize where progress is being made or progress is not being made short of that investment of time 
into the person. And that is really, I, from, from my perspective, I think that's the nature of the qualitative. You can't have it without a conversation, without active listening. So we would say that uh, as we maybe wrap up some of the learning from this conversation that done well from a leadership standpoint and an organizational standpoint, the qualitative and the quantitative should complement each other. Absolutely. And part of our role as leaders is to help people understand how they fit together. Mm -hmm. That certain human interactions, certain motivations, mm -hmm. attitudes, interactions lead to measurable outcomes. Mm -hmm. But if we don't explain that, it's going to be very difficult to have our colleagues make the small necessary adjustments that we would believe lead to large differentials in outcomes. Yes. So Patrick Lencioni addresses this a lot within the, the concept of a cohesive leadership team. Yes. And the narratives that we begin to form in our head that are incomplete, but they're the stories we tell ourselves mm -hmm. about ourselves and about others. There needs to be something, and that is found in the qualitative, I believe, to begin to correct those narratives. Mm -hmm. Because if the narrative sets up, that's often fueled by quantitative or transactional data. The qualitative is, helps us to know how do we develop people. And in essence, we are we're community. We're, we are wired for community. Mm -hmm. Transactions occur as a byproduct of our wiring for community. Mm -hmm. Community does not exist to create the transaction. So as we're putting a wrap on this, I, I, it leads me to a question that I fairly often get when we're discussing an engagement with a prospective client. Because most of the uh, outcomes, sometimes called deliverables in the consulting world, are described by us at North Group in qualitative terms. Mm -hmm. We believe that they will, at some point, done well, lead to even better quantitative outcomes. Mm -hmm. But we're not ready to describe what those quantitative outcomes will be. And on some level, somebody else is taking responsibility for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm often asked, Roger, how will you know when we reach this strong, cohesive leadership team that you're describing. And I find that a very challenging question, but I've also found that if I describe that in less than quantitative terms, I will fall short of helping the person who's asking the question. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this response? Mm -hmm. And you Mm -hmm. I say, what do you think? You've probably used it. Uh, you, we've probably been meetings together where we've said it. But people will often say to me, Roger, how, do you, how will we know when we are becoming a strong, cohesive leadership team? I'll say, well, I think one of the things is you will be able to measure less meetings after the meetings. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, the type of thing where less than the full complement of people leave the meeting, regather in someone's office or at happy hour or some other place and begin to discuss without the benefit of the entire team things that went on in the meeting. That is a very inefficient way for a team to operate. Mm -hmm. As the team gets more cohesive, you will have less of those meetings, which are frankly a waste of time. Absolutely. That's one measurement and are we going to put tally sheets in for that? Oh, we used to have six meetings after the meetings between each leadership team and now, team meeting, and now we're down to two. I don't know if we would do it that way, but we could. And it would be a real indication. And so I think there are ways to help people, particularly in our world of organizational mm -hmm. leadership, uh, leadership effectiveness, teamwork, the elusiveness of teamwork, to actually apply some real measurements to that so that we are measuring the right things to live out the truism that what gets measured gets done. There, there, there should be no misinterpretation that measures are helpful and necessary because what gets measured gets done. I would add possibly one qualitative layer to that tally is when, because there will always be a meeting after a meeting, but the question 
comes. Are they minimizing? But what's the content? So the meeting after the meeting, if you have two to three individuals that are coming back with solutions, as opposed to a rehash of, well, I can't believe so-and-so, or I can't believe that they're asking for, or, but they're coming to a table and saying, actually, here's how we could move the ball down the field. You yeah. can move the needle by doing this. And let's get everybody together and see if we can all get committed to that movement of the ball down the field in that fashion. Absolutely. Yes. What gets measured gets done. True. True. The measurements that we're using, extremely important. A balance of qualitative and quantitative, even more important. Incredibly and the nuance so. of how those are put together. That's the business of great leadership. For sure, Roger. Thank you, John. Enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the North Group Podcast. For more information about North Group Consultants, please visit northgroupconsultants.com.